హలో ఎవ్రీ వన్ దిస్ ఇస్ డాక్టర్ మధుసూదన్ రావు అండ్ ది ప్రోగ్రామ్ ఐ టీచ్ మెడికల్ స్టూడెంట్స్ టుడే మై టాపిక్ ఈజ్ ఆన్ ద సెవెంత్ క్రేనల్ నవ్ ద ఫేషియల్ నవ్ ఫేషియల్ నవ్ ఈజ్ ఎ కాంప్లెక్స్ అండ్ మోస్ట్ ఇంట్రెస్టెడ్ క్రేనల్ నవ్ ఇట్ హస్ గాచ్ లాట్ ఆఫ్ ఫంక్షన్స్ లైక్ మోటార్ సెక్రటరీ మోటార్ అండ్ సెన్సరీ ఫంక్షన్స్ ఇట్ ఈస్ గాట్ మోటార్ న్యూక్లియా ఇట్ ఈస్ గాట్ ది సెన్సరీ న్యూక్లియా అండ్ సెక్రటరీ మోటార్ న్యూక్లియా ది న్యూక్లియస్ ఆర్ ది ఫేషియల్ నవ్ హెస్ గాట్ ఆల్ దీస్ కాంపోనెంట్స్ లొకేటెడ్ ఇన్ ది అప్పర్ ఫాన్స్ ఇన్ఫీరియర్ లేటర్ టు ది న్యూక్లియస్ ఆఫ్ ది ఆప్షన్స్ నవ్ వెల్ coming to the motor nucleus motor nucleus of the facial now has got two components it has got the dorsal nucleus and the lateral nucleus dorsal nucleus innervate the muscles of expression of the upper face and the lateral nucleus innervate the muscles of voluntary ex- expression of the lower face the lateral motor nucleus of the facial nerve in the pons receive the innervation from the motor cortex of both the hemispheres that means dorsal motor nucleus of the facial nerve in the pons is innervated by the upper motor neurons received from both the hemispheres that means muscles of the upper face are bilaterally innervated whereas the lateral motor nucleus or the facial nerve in the pons it receives the upper motor neuron neurons from the contralateral motor cortex of the opposite hemisphere so the upper face is bilaterally represented whereas lower face is innervated by the fibers receiving receiving from the contralateral motor cortex so in the lesions of the upper motor neuron of the facial nerve upper face is spared only there is weakness of the muscles of lower face then coming to the secretory motor fibers the secretory motor fibers that run in the facial now are the axons of for the cell bodies in the dendritic ganglia okay which receive their fibers from the nervus intermedius nervous intermediates they send their axons which cross the midline and run in the medial lemniscus on, on the opposite side reach the thalamus to end in the contralateral postcentral gyrus that is central sensory cortex that is a part of the secretory motor function uh, the fibers of the facial nerve which uh, innervate the lacrimal and salivary glands bring out this function that is secretory motor function through the innervation of the salivary and the lacrimal glands well next is the sensory pathway sensory pathway the fibers innervate the Uh, anterior two thirds of the tongue for taste sensation and uh, the pin and the auditory external auditory meters for general sensation and the axons carrying the general sensation from the pin and the external auditory meters the end in uh, the cell body so the genuclear body genuclear ganglia from there 
they reach the pawns to enter the fifth now nucleus and from there they cross the cross to the opposite side to run in the medial lemniscus reach the thalamus ultimately the axons of the cell walls in the thalamus they end up in the fourth central gyrus for the sensory perception then with regard to the taste sensation the nerve fibers that carry the taste sensation from the anterior two thirds of the tongue they are carried in the cauda tympani branch of the lingual nerve they end in the cell bodies of the genital ganglia from there they reach the nucleus sarcoides in the pons and the upper medulla from the nucleus sarcoides the fibers cross to the opposite side ascend up in the medial lemniscus to reach the thalamus ultimately in the in the taste center in the post central gyrus of the parietal lobe and few in the hypothalamus these are the motor secretory motor and the sensory pathways of the facial nerve having understood the anatomic anatomical considerations of the facial nerve and its features then we will go to the features of the various lesions of the facial nerve how they occur what are the manifestations various syndromes etc besides we also consider the blood supply of the various parts where the nuclei of the facial nerve and the respective tracts are affected due to the injuries here this picture shows the nucleus of the facial nerve in the upper pons in close proximity to the nucleus intermedius and the solitary nucleus and the nucleus of the abscess nerve this is the nucleus solitarius this is the nucleus intermedius and uh, this is a uh, sorry this is this nucleus for the nucleus for uh, this a uh, salivary nucleus well uh, this is the absent now nucleus this is the facial now nucleus this is the facial now in close proximity with the vestibular cochlea now in the vestibular canal this is the facial now that is exiting from the stylo mastoid foramen to supply the various parts in the face and the salivary glands and the lacrimal glands etc this is the course of the facial now in the facial canal and it's a branch to the stapedius and this is the geniculate body geniculate ganglia this is the cauda tympani that carries the fibers for the taste sensation from the anterior to the of the tongue as i told you the nucleus of the facial nerve is located in the pons anterolateral to the nucleus of the sixth nerve there is got the motor sensory and secretory motor components motor in turn has got the two components dorsal motor nucleus and the ventral motor nucleus sensory function is carried out by the nervous intermedius for uh, the secretory motor function and the nucleus solitarius for the 
this sensation. Nucleus for the secretory motor function is the salivary nuclei and the lacrimal nuclei. Then, so as I uh, have seen uh, the various nuclei of the facial nerve, as the names indicates, they carry out their respective functions. Motor nuclei control the voluntary expression of the facial muscles, voluntary contraction of the facial nerves, facial muscles. Secretory motor to supply the submandibular, sublingual, and the lacrimal glands. Taste sensation from the anterior two thirds of the tongue and the somatic sensation from the pinna and the external artery meters. Well, motor pathway, anyway, I would explain that is uh, the upper motor neurons, they are from the Premotor or precental gyrus of the frontal lobe that is the motor cortex. From there, corticobulbar fibers descend into the internal capsule. They enter the crust cerebri to enter the midbrain. From there, innervate the motor nuclei of the facial nerve, either dorsal nucleus or the lateral nucleus. As I told you before, dorsal nucleus in turn innervates the muscles of voluntary expression of the upper face, whereas the lateral nucleus innervates the muscles of lower face. Well, lower motor neuron start from the cell bodies, located into the motor nuclei of the facial now. The axons of the motor neuron innervate the muscles of facial expression on same side and controls the voluntary expression. So the emotional expressions are controlled by limbic and extrapyramidal systems. That means nuclei or the cell bodies for the lower motor neuron. This lower motor neuron cell bodies are located in the motor nucleus of the facial nerve in the pons. The axons they form the lower motor neuron. supplying the ipsilateral muscles of the fish for the voluntary expression. Okay. Whereas the emotional expression is controlled by the limbic and the extrapyramidal systems. Well, secretary motor pathway already explained that is superior salivary and lacrimal nuclei located in the posterior to the motor nucleus receive fibers from the hypothalamus nervous intermediates and ultimately innervate the salivary and lacrimal glands to put it in a simpler way this is what it is yeah this is how it is center is hypothalamus then the inter nervous intermediates from there superior and salivary lacrimal nuclei and the facial now and salivary glands and the lacrimal glands are supplied they are parasympathetic that means the the centers that hypothalamus and the nervous intermediates from the contralateral side supply the structures of the salivary and lacrimal glands of the opposite side of the body. 
So to put it in another way, the fibers from the salivary glands and the lacrimal glands, they have their cell bodies in the geniculate ganglia. From the fibers from the geniculate gland, which I told you, they are they run in the nervous intermediates and ultimately enter the hypothalamus hypothalamus their center in the cortex so this is the secretory motor pathway i have already explained so to put it in a simpler way the secretory motor pathway um, function of the facial nerve is carried out by the its branches to the salivary glands and uh, the lacrimal glands which have their nuclei in uh, the pons as uh, the salivary nucleus and the lacrimal nuclei posterior to the motor nuclei these nuclei they receive the axons from the cell bodies of uh, the the nucleate body from there they pass run in the nervous intermediates ultimately reach the salivary and the lacrimal nuclei the fibers cross to the opposite side and end up in the centers for the secretory mode of function in the hypothalamus through nervous intermediates this is briefly the secretory motor pathway for the facial nerve well sensory pathway i already ex- explained from uh, the taste from the anterior two thirds of the tongue and general sensation from uh, the pin and the external auditory meters let us not repeat again then coming to the clinical consider- considerations as by and large when you are examining the facial nerve we are more so mindful about uh, the facial expression due to voluntary contraction of the facial muscles either upper face or the lower face then rest of the sensory functions we usually not carry out in uh, the routine examination for the facial now but in certain occasions we are forced to examine the taste sense in the anterior two thirds of the tongue but it is also difficult but by and large and the patient will expressing that they have lost the taste sensation but uh, the perception by the patient is very difficult because it is uh, it involves the one half of the tongue that is anterior two thirds not the posterior one third once you keep something in the over the tongue close your mouth and that uh, stimulus is going to trigger the uh, i mean uh, that particular material is going to trigger the sensation the posterior one third of the tongue also so to differentiate whether the loss of the taste sense is due to the due to the uh, defect in the anterior two thirds or the posterior one third is very difficult well coming to the clinical considerations so the symptom dose is described in terms of upper motor neuron lesion and the lower motor neuron lesions well coming to the motor functions as upper motor neuron lesion and the lower motor neuron lesion on the facial nerve upper motor neuron lesion so lesion could be anywhere from uh, this cerebral cortex and the precentral gyrus down to the motor nucleus of the pons it could be in uh, the cerebral cortex or it could be in uh, the internal capsule or it could be in the midbrain or it could be anywhere yeah body nucleus of the facial now
So that means lesion could be anywhere from the precentral gyrus, the area of motor, upper motor nerve cell bodies, along the course of the corticobulbar fibers, till its nucleus in the pons. That is the stretch of the or extent of the upper motor neuron. So it could be due to stroke because of the vascular lesion. It could be due to tumors and the infections or vasculitis. It results in the contralateral lower face weakness and contralateral hemiplasia and contralateral sensory loss depending upon the extent of the lesion. It is the upper motor neural lesions, it is the contralateral lower face that is affected and the upper face is spared. If the lesion in the cerebral cortex, what are the features? It involves the neurons of the patient having the precentral gyrus that is located under the lower part of the superior lateral part of the cerebral hemisphere hemisphere in its precentral gyrus. It results in the contralateral lower face weakness, contralateral hemiplasia that also depends upon the extent of the lesion and seizures is the classical sign of cortical lesion because it will irritate the cell bodies resulting in seizures. <clears throat> dysphasia or aphasia if the lesion is in the dominant hemisphere Dominus, dominant hemisphere is responsible for the speech that is the left hemisphere in right handed and also the left, left hemisphere is some of the, most of the right handed persons If the lesion is in the internal capsule, there is weakness of the contralateral lower face, there is contralateral hemiplasia, contralateral hemianesthesia, and visual and auditory disturbances depend, depending on the extent of the lesion. And there are no seizures, understood? No aphasia and there is fast recovery. These are the features of the lesion in internal capsule. This is the structural representation of the internal capsules and the divisions in the anterior limb, genu and posterior limb. Each part of the internal capsule containing the tracts, descending and ascending tracts. Then lower motor neural lesions. In the pons, lower motor neural starts from the nucleus of the patient now in the pons and along its course to supply the muscles of the face. It could be in the pons, it could be at the ponto medullary junction, it could be between the intracranial cords outside the ponto medullary junction. So it can be divided into intracranial, intracerebral, or intracerebral and intracranial on the extracranial. Extracranial in the vestibular canal and extracranial could be in the facial canal, etc. There are various levels of injury to the facial nerve that is lower motor neuron from its origin at its nucleus in the pass down to its branches to supply the muscles of expression of the face. It could be due to stroke, either tumors, 
infections there are different syndromes depending upon the level of yeast mobius syndrome miller gobler syndrome foveli syndrome it is classically associated with ipsilateral total facial palsy and contralateral spastic hemiplegia if the lesion is in the pons involving the lower motor neuron it will cause the ipsilateral total facial nerve palsy with contralateral spastic hemiplegia they are described in as different syndromes millet gobler foveli's depending upon the extent of the lesion in the pons coming to the foveli syndrome that is medial pontens syndrome before we go to this uh, understand the blood supply of the pons then we have got the vertebral basal system that is the posterior stroves posterior circulation is based upon the vertebral basal system there are two vertebral arteries after entering the brain they merge together at the lower part of the pons to form the basal artery the paramedian branches from the basal artery and the penetrating branches of the superior posterior cerebral arteries they supply the pons and lesions of the paramedian branches or the branches of the posterior cerebral artery can result in the different syndrome described as as the median pontens syndrome or foveli syndrome in median medial pontens syndrome there is a infarction of the pons extending from the inferior medial part towards the involvement of the that is a few structures like the like uh, the centers for the horizontal base that is the parapontal reticular formation etc so here in foveli syndrome there is uh, involvement of the basal artery medial and small paramedian branches and the extent of the point and infarct depends on the vessels involved dorsal medial pons at its segmentum is affected it could be due to tumors or due to inflammation the clinical features how they present in foveli syndrome there is a contralateral spastic hemiplegia due to the involvement of the cortico spinal fibers that is pyramidal fibers ipsilateral total facial palsy due to involvement of the uh facial nerve nucleus and ipsilateral rectal lateral rectus palsy because of the sixth nerve pa- involvement ipsilateral horizontal gaze paralysis because of the involvement of the parapontin reticular formation then look at this particular picture medial infarct inferior pontin syndrome this is the area so 
sometimes it in fact is extensive so it will be associated with extended features with epsilateral loss of pain and temperature over the face because of the involvement of the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve epsilateral sensory neural deafness because of the involvement of the eighth nerve epsilateral horner syndrome because of the involvement of sympathetics and a contralateral hemianesthesia because of the involvement involvement of the medial lemniscus there is a good picture that is uh, missing here but i'll show you well take it to the while dealing with sixth now we had uh, some pictorial representation of the mid brain syndromes so we lost that slide well so supposing if you remember this particular diagram that is the section of the mid brain that uh, uh, section of the pons that is representing uh, the this is the fascia now and their fibers during their course down to the pontomedullary medial medial junction these are the pyramidal fibers this is the medial lemniscus yes substantia nigra other than things like that is if the lesion is extensive like this causing the medial pontine syndrome the results in the ipsilateral fascian now ipsilateral absin now then ipsilateral gaze paralysis and uh, contralateral spastic hemiplegia and uh, ipsilateral that is the sensory loss because of the involvement of the medial lemniscus so because these structures ascend ascending tracts are the sensory tracts descending are the motor fibers it shows the involvement of the ipsilateral sensory losses ipsilateral cranial nerve palsies and the contralateral motor weakness that is about the foveal syndrome extended foveal syndrome then coming to the millet gobbler millet gobbler is uh, the actually described as the medial pontine syndrome there is a foveal syndrome is described as the lateral pontine syndrome but if it is extended it involves most of the structures down there in the pons the lesion is the ventral medial part of the pons in the millet gobbler that is ventral or medial whereas the foveal syndrome the parts affected are the from medial to the lateral more extensive lesion in the foveal syndrome okay and it is like this there are uh, three pontine syndrome that are described that is one is the rehman syndrome that is limited to the med- lower medial part of the pons involving the descending fibers of the absence nerve and the pyramidal fibers with showing the ipsilateral absence nerve palsy with the contralateral spastic hemiplegia there is a little more extended lesion involving the fascian nerve that is the foci- uh, that is the foveal syndrome which involves the facial and the pyramidal and the absence of uh, para- fibers including the pprf that results in the 
classical features of Fowler syndrome described are the contralateral spastic hemiplegia, ipsilateral facial and the abstinence no paralysis, ipsilateral horizontal gaze paralysis. These are the features of the Fowler syndrome. If it is extended, it involves the medial meniscus, it involves the uh, sympathetics, etc. So that is about the Fowler syndrome, otherwise called the lateral pontine syndrome. Millet copular is uh, the medial pontine syndrome. The, but the lesion is the ventromedial part of the pons, more caudally. So it was described in 1858, also called as the facial absence pyramidal syndrome. The pale face on the tracks and the nerve fibers that are affected in this particular infarct. Lesion in ventral medial pons caudally. So that means that part is supplied by the upper basilar artery branches base, um, branches from the upper part of the basilar artery and the paramedian branches of the basilar artery and also the penetrating branches of the posterior cerebral artery it is characterized by cross and pontine syndrome with weakness of the ipsilateral face ipsilateral lateral rectus Cross the hemiplegia. The fibers of the sixth, seventh nerves during their course through the ventromedial pons are affected along with the corticospinal fibers. This is very simple to understand as I told, showed you the diagram. Spinothalamic and the medial limbs are spared. In this particular minute, it is limited to the medial pons. Card, in the caudal part, it uh, spares the spinothalamic fibers in the medial meniscus. So it could be due to ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke, tumors, neurocystic psychosis, either tuberculosis or multiple sclerosis. So these are the situations wherein uh, this particular syndrome can set in. Uh, well, this is the millet gobbler. The lesion is limited to the medial part of the pons in its caudal part. Then what is the Mobius syndrome? It is a very rare syndrome wherein uh, the, there is underdevelopment of the 6th and 7th cranial nerves due to some vascular insufficiency during fetal development. There is lack of facial expression, inability to close the eyes, inability to close the mouth, inability to move eyes laterally, delayed speech, dental anomalies, high arched palate, palate, chest abnormalities, but intellect is intact. This is Mobius syndrome. These are the pictorial representation of Mobius syndrome. Then coming to the lower motor neuron lesions. The lesion could be extracerebral but intracranial. The most common lesion here is the acoustic neuroma that results in the ipsilateral facial and vestibular cochlear palsy. The long tracks are spray spread. When you come across total ipsilateral facial weakness without the symptoms of the long tracks, that is the hemiplegia, etc., it is the lesion is in the extra cerebral part of the facial nerve. Lower motor neuron lesion of 
extra cranial part of the seventh nerve. It could be either due to infections, herpes simplex causes Bell's palsy, varicella zoster is associated with Ramsey Hunt, Lyme disease, and HIV. It could be due to demyelination, resulting part of the Guillain-Barre syndrome. It could be vascular lesion. It could be trauma or neoplasms. Coming to the Bell's palsy. This is the patient with Bell's palsy showing the total facial paralysis on the right side. There is my, angle of the mouth is deviated to the opposite side because of the unopposed, unopposed reaction of the muscles on the normal side of the face due, due to the contraction of the orbicularis oris yes the angle of the mouth is deviated to the normal side so on the face, side of the lesion there is no wrinkling of the face there is wide palpable fissure and there is no nasolabial fold there is a drooping of the angle of the mouth with salivation, dooling of saliva on the side of the lesion. On the side of the lesion. Absence of frontal creases, drooping of the eyeball, wide palpable fissure, absence nasolabial fold, and uh, Drooping of the angular mouth with drooling of the saliva, you can see in the lower motor neuron facial nerve palsy. This is again the picture showing the facial nerve palsy, bell palsy. Drooping of eyelid, inability to close the eyeball, then attempt to close the eyeball. There is rolling above the eyeball. This is the bell sign. Inability to pull cheeks and uh, angle of the mouth is asymmetrical. Drooping of the corner of the mouth and dry mouth and dry eyes. Here is patient is complaining of pain at the angle of the jaw. This could be the symptom related to the appearance of the rash in Ramsey Hunt syndrome. There are the vesicular rash or the pinna of the ear, external artery meters and a part of the upper part of the neck posterior to the angle of the jaw. That is the, you can see the vesicles. This, are, this is seen in the Ramsey Hunt syndrome due to the involvement of the geniculate ganglion due to herpes zoster. This is the Ramsey Hunt syndrome. Facial nerve palsy involving the lower motor neuron, vesicular erythematous rash or the pinna external artery canal hyperacusis, loss of taste or anterior two-thirds of the time, tinnitus, vertigo, sensorial neural deafness because the lesion may extend to involve the vestibular cochlear now. Sensorial neural deafness, sometimes nausea and vomiting, the cause is varicella zoster involving the geniculate ganglion and the facial canal. There is variable response to treatment with steroids and acyclovir. This is how we go about uh, the, <coughs> this particular syndrome, treating with steroids and acyclovir. Well, dear students, this is a brief discussion on the clinical aspects of the facial nerve and uh, 
attached in detail detail anatomical aspects of the face and now i'll try to show some of the features and i have taken a lot of time thank you for patient listening thank you very much and hope my talk on the face and now is of good help for you students thank you very much we'll meet again next time until that time bye bye